Hello and welcome to Dean Villarule's annual webinar. My name is Ashley Ritter. I am a two-time Penn Nursing alumna, current doctoral student, and I'm the president of the Penn Nursing Alumni Board. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming you to the Penn Nursing Alumni webinar featuring our Dean, Tony Villarule. On behalf of the board members who volunteer their time and energy to bring you events and programming we hope you find valuable, and the Nursing Alumni Office, thank you for joining us today. This webinar is scheduled for one hour. Before we get started, let's go over some basics on using the webinar features. Everyone is muted on the call so we can reduce background noise. During the presentation, you can communicate with the organizer about any tech concerns via the chat function. And you can submit any questions for me or the Dean using the question function. On the right side of your screen, you should see the GoToWebinar control panel. This is typically a gray box that provides you with information on the webinar functions and ways to interact with the organizers. The red arrow on the box allows you to minimize and maximize the box according to your preference. Let's start with the control panel in its maximized position. Near the bottom of the box, you should see a section heading titled Questions. This is where you can type questions during the webinar. Questions can be submitted at any time during the presentation. Dean Villarule will answer questions at the end. The other feature I would like to point out is the raised hand function. If you need to interact with me privately during the presentation concerning an issue with the call or another logistical concern, you can raise your hand by clicking the small icon on the left side of the control panel. I would like to conclude our overview by checking everyone's audio. If you can hear me, please raise your hand using the icon. Great, thank you. It looks like you can hear me. I will go ahead and clear out all of the raised hands. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Dean Tony Villarule, the sixth dean of the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing, and only the second alumna to serve in this position. Since assuming the deanship in July of 2014, Dean Villarule has already made her mark in creating partnerships and envisioning projects that will strengthen and enhance the school's reputation and work which she will share more about with you today. The format of this webinar will be conversational. I will ask Dean Villarule questions in several areas, many sparked by questions our attendees submitted in advance. Please continue to submit any questions during our session. There will be time for question and answer at the end as well. Dean Villarule, I'm so excited to have this opportunity to be here with you today. As a graduate myself and as the alumni board president, I love to hear from you about the school is doing and will be doing as you look ahead to the future. I know there's so much going on at the school. Could you share some of the updates that are particularly exciting? Hi, Ashley, and thanks for the intro. It's, as always, it's great to be with you. And I'm so pleased to be here with many of our alumni friends um, and all of those who have dialed in with us today. I'm always happy to talk about the school, and there's so much good news, I don't even know where to start. Um, at the alumni events we've hosted around the country this year, I've told our attendees that I could share with you the latest awards and accolades that our faculty and students have received. Uh, so for example, two of our faculty members have been uh, named as fellows in the National Academy of Medicine, uh, Dr. Terry Richmond and Martha Curley. I'm especially proud that we have been ranked as the number one nursing school in the world for the third year. Woohoo! So I know we've always said it, but here is the evidence <laughs> that shows uh, that is absolutely true. Uh, we're also number one in research awards among all nursing schools in the country. And again, uh, that, that reflects the hard work and the great recruiting that we've done in this last year. So again, our community really, really celebrates that. But recently the provost asked me, um, what are you most proud of that you accomplished in this past year? And you only need to take a look at this slide here. We have been so fortunate in recruiting a, a stellar group of faculty, both senior and junior, uh, from within Penn and without, outside of Penn. We have two PIC professors, Dr. George Demiris and Dr. Risa Lavisa More, who started with us in, um, in January along with, again, some junior faculty and, and faculty from the outside. 
we hired these, um, these outstanding scholars because they represent areas that we intend to grow on, both in precision science and also in data science. Our new faculty focus on issues ranging from nutrition to smart home technology, from reducing hospital readmissions to secondary swelling and challenges faced by cancer patients, and from injury risks in urban environments to issues in health policy and health equity. And they're so enthused about teaching our students as well, so they're extremely well-rounded. I wish we had time today for me to tell you more about these folk in detail, or more importantly, that they had time to tell you about their incredible work. You'll be able to read more about some of them in the Penn Magazine and on our website, and I hope there's future opportunities for our alums to engage with them as well. I agree, the new faculty are quite an impressive group. I've had the pleasure of meeting many of them and look forward to learning more about their impact. Impact is something I see in many of our recent stories about Penn Nursing. Can you tell me a little bit, bit more about our students as well as our new Postmasters DNP program? Sure, um, and again, this reflects um, in other areas that I'm, again, excited about. So as accomplished as our faculty are, our students are equally um, accomplished. I'm proud, again, that we have a, an undergrad who is a winner of the President's Engagement Prize, and her story was featured yesterday in Penn News Today. Aliana Hall is working with Cindy Connolly and also with Nancy Biller to um, implement a project that she's been working on for a long time in Mexico. She's an incredible and driven student, and with the support of our faculty, we are just so, so proud of her and, and the award. Um, I'm proud to, to note that half of the engagement prizes wow. have been uh, awarded to Penn Nursing or from students working with Penn Nursing faculty. So for being the smallest undergrad school, the impact that we've had is Im immeasurable. Uh, some of our other students have won and been recognized for their work in diversity from the Brister Society, and our um, students continue to mop up um, mm -hmm. the student nursing awards um, and leadership uh, within, within SNAP, uh, again, led by an outstanding alum and faculty director, um, Diane, Diane Spatt. So um, one of the things that was a priority for me or part of our strategic plan was thinking about where we fit in the DNP space. And again, with a group of dedicated faculty, uh, we are proud that we have opened up um, admission and actually had a recruiting event this week to those that were accepted um, to our, pro uh, interviewed and accepted into our program this past week. So our hope, um, not our hope, we will um, be starting our first cohort of DNP Postmaster students in, in September. Uh, so stay tuned about that. Excellent. Now I'd like to turn the conversation to an area where I know you have focused a lot of your energy, on creating a culture of innovation here at Penn Nursing. Can you talk a little bit about why this is so important and some of the ways that Penn Nursing is supporting innovation? Sure, and thank you for that, Ashley. So in innovation can be a buzzword. It's something that we see in um, many different areas and many different products. But here at Penn, we have a long history, and Penn Nursing certainly has been a leader in innovation, along with other nurses. So we only need to take a look at our, our founder, Ben Franklin, to see how deeply innovation is rooted um, in, our, in our university. He certainly is known as the uh, first and, and probably most prolific innovator of, of his time, and his innovations have been timeless. You know as well that innovation is a key cornerstone of the Penn Compact. Uh, Penn Compact 2020. And when we you know, first thought about innovation and where we sit in this space, many times people think about tech and gadgets. But when you think about it, nurses innovate from the very beginning. At the bedside, nurses get the jo job done as a matter of life and death. And if there are barriers that are in the way, they figure out workaround or figure out solutions to be able to meet the needs of patients and families. If a system or tool doesn't exist, I've seen and we've all heard about nurses creating what they need to help. There's always problems to be solved, and Penn Nursing has never been work about has never been about leaving that work undone. We've always risen to the challenge, and we are and have always been a school and a community dedicated to making change happen, to innovating not just for care and cures, but for life and living. So right now, our focus is about supporting and building on the innovation that nurses are already doing and challenging us to go to the next step and creating visibility for the work that we do. 
It's about adding the tools and structures to ensure that nurses at any level can create system-wide changes that were at the table in the innovation lab and that the innovations in health and healthcare aren't just a business model created in a vacuum, but are better solutions to real problems based on best practices that will work for the patient, the caregiver, and the system. Dean, I couldn't agree with you more. One of the things I appreciate about your explanation is that innovation does not equate technology. While technology is certainly a huge part of the future of healthcare, innovation can and should happen in our delivery of care models as well. I'm reminded of some ways this, that the school is supporting innovation right now. Can you tell our attendees about this? Sure, and I, I, you know, I'm so excited about where we've come in the short year, in the short year and a half around defining what innovation is for the school and really moving, moving on it. So here on this slide, you can just see a few ways that we're investing in and supporting the hub of innovation. So about a year ago, um, I asked the overseers to um, put together an innovation committee to give guidance to the school as it explored different avenues to foster innovation. The faculty member, Terry Richman, who is our Associate Dean for Research and Innovation, and board member, Seth Ginns, who has really been, I call him this in a very loving way, an agitator about moving us into this space, really led and inspired the effort. Uh, he was later joined by Rich Panola, who again uh, has incredible perspectives on innovation and business savvy. So the group of our uh, overseers includes entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and vent uh, business leaders who are an amazing sounding board for ideas, but importantly are helping us think about things that we haven't thought about before. I'm really excited that Marion Leary, an alumni, was hired as the school's first innovation specialist to accelerate the efforts to build the culture of innovation with the focus on infusing design thinking into our curriculum, and in doing so, we're creating a new generation of nurse innovators. Now, I'm not sure if you know Marion, but she's an absolute bundle of energy. Absolutely. Has so many ideas, and I, I'm, I'm running to catch up with her, and I think we all are. And delivers on the ideas. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're encouraging the development of technology and apps and exploring ways to get our students and faculty the support they need to compete in challenges like the one, one pictured here. Dean, you mentioned Rich Panola, whose wife Krista is a class of 1986 BSN alumna and a former alumna president. They seem to have a focus on innovation. So absolutely, and we're, abs we're thrilled that they're, um, they're part of our world and part of this initiative. Chris and, Rich gave the, Chris and Rich gave the inaugural gift in 27 to launch the new Nursing Innovation Fund an initiative that allows Penn Nursing to explore a variety of pathways towards culture building, toward building a culture of innovation. So we're grateful for their support of this gift along with other support, which will allow us to take risks and explore new types of innovation. I think one of the things that was particularly inspiring about Rich and Chris was they, just, they did not just want to give us funds, but they really wanted to be partners with us the faculty and students in creating this culture, and we're thrilled again that Rich has taken this leadership position along with Seth to help guide us in that way. Rich and Krista really are amazing and strong supporters of this school and have been for many years. I'm also impressed by Marion Leary. Last year, Marion was named Philadelphia's Geek of the Year for 2017. I hear her name everywhere, and in fact, she'll be featured as, as a speaker at a Penn-wide Philadelphia uh, Alumni Club event here in Philadelphia in the fall. One of the things I appreciate about the culture of innovation you've developed is how it stretches far beyond Fagan Hall. In an email that you and I sent out to alumni recently, we asked for stories of innovation. I'm thrilled that we have several alumni to share stories with us today. We've invited three alumni to share their stories of innovation. Casey Benjamin, Allison Ricoli, and Kasimbi Thomas are joining us live on this webinar just in just a few moments. Each of them has applied their Penn nursing experience in different arenas, arenas to address real world challenges that will have impact on a specific community. We'll be, begin with Casey, who as a current women's health student is dialing in during their clinical right now. We'll follow directly after Casey with Allison, a BSN and MSN alumna, then conclude with Kasimbi, the Dean's former student who is joining us from Kenya. Casey, can you tell us your story of innovation? 
My name is Casey. I use they, them pronouns, and I am dialing in from clinical right now. So that's one way that Penn is very innovative. Um, I'm a current uh, postpartum nurse at the University of Pennsylvania um, Hospital. That's at 34th and Spruce. I'm also a nursing alum, so I graduated from the undergraduate program in 2014. And I'm a current WHNP student expected to graduate this month um, or next month. Um, so my innovation that I was asked to talk about is um, a project project I'm working on on my nursing unit. So I noticed that there. Yeah. You, you, you faded out for a minute. Oh, sorry. Um, so I work with people right after they have babies. And one of my jobs is to help people fill out their birth certificate and social security form. Um, and we've had a lot of uh, LGBTQ plus folks delivering on our floor and the paperwork just wasn't applying. So um, originally we were having people fill out paperwork that had only a slot for mother and father. Um, so as a queer nurse, this was very um, important and I had a very to another nurse. I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, can you hear me better now? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, I'm gonna turn up the volume on my computer as well. Um, so I reached out to another nurse on my floor who's also a pen alum. And we reached out to my manager to see what could be done about changing this paperwork to be more inclusive of diverse family structures. Um, and so we also wanted to conduct a lit review to see what kinds of changes were supported by the evidence in order to make sure that the paperwork that we made was actually applicable. To we had a lot of, um, are you able to hear me? Now we are, you, you, you cut out for just a few moments. If you could back up 10 seconds. Okay, sorry. Um, so, all right, just let me know when I'm, I'm cutting out again. Um, so it. basically, with our literature review, we were noticing that there's a lot of health disparities and avoidance of healthcare among the queer community. And a lot of that starts with the first and the smallest thing. So things like paperwork not being inclusive for these communities. So we figured that this change would be right along with helping to decrease the disparities that the, that the patients were having. Um, so we actually talked to clinical nurses on our floor, nursing leadership, the medical record committee, um, operations, and the birth registry unit in order to make sure our edited version would be able to pass through. So we actually have it, the birth certificate and social security form saying parent one and parent two. And we edited the form in English and Spanish. So it's implemented on our unit right now, but the change is going to be made pen. Penn-wide? Uh, Penn-wide, yes. So any hospital, so Pennsylvania Hospital um, and Chester County and anyone else um, in there. Um, so Penn, I think, has changed the way, and going to Penn has changed the way I think about what nursing is. Um, because although we're taught to take care of a patient, I think that Penn really emphasizes what that means and that it's more than just um, providing life-saving medication. It's also about making sure that we're taking care of the patient as a whole and making them feel safe and welcome. And any willing to work with me on this, and as a bedside nurse, I have always felt that this was my job, is to, to make these changes. So I'm really grateful to have been part of this, and I obviously keep coming back for more pen. So um, I'm really excited about the changes that that's happening on the unit, and I'm hoping to see it happen other places too. Well, Casey, we're so proud of you, and thank you. Uh, really impressive and important work, and I think you articulate nursing quite well. Next up, we'll hear from Allison. Hi, yes, uh, my name is Allison Urkel. I'm a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. I completed the BSN MSN program at Penn, and during that time, I was actually able to complete a comparative study course in India. Uh, after I graduated, I stayed connected with Penn, first by being a clinical instructor and now being a lecturer for the master's psych seminar course. 
Um, so during that, that's how I found out about a new opportunity called the Global Nursing Fellowship. And this was born out of a desire to collaborate with an NGO in India because one of the co-founders received the 2018 Renfield Award. Uh, so my job was to help design a program to teach community health workers low-cost medical or nursing skills. The community health workers are already skilled in psychological and social welfare interventions, but adding the nursing skills will allow the program to serve the community in a more holistic manner, or what we call in mental health the biopsychosocial paradigm. Uh, so while I was there, we had a trial run of some of the lessons in which um, I helped create. And so we broke up into small groups and did like hands-on learning things, such as like learning how to take uh, someone's pulse or their temperature, height and weight, and like other vital signs like that. Um, and then we also used the small groups to teach each other about various conditions and healthy ways of living, because one of my goals for the program was to help those community health workers become community leaders and educators themselves. Uh, so originally in India, how it is now, um, students, including how they use the program, are very used to a mostly lecture style learning. Um, but they told me after this kind of trial run, they loved learning the hard skills that they can now use. And they told me how much they became much more confident to both understand the concepts and then explain to their neighbors what they're already seeing in the community. Uh, the next step is that apparently the government wants to extend the program throughout the state so and teach much more, um, many more community members how to become health leaders. So we're trying to polish that up um, and get that up and running. Excellent, Allison. It sounds like your impact is reaching quite far and I love to hear about your continued connection with Penn. And next we have Kasimbi joining us from Kenya. Hi everyone. I was in the inaugural nursing and healthcare management um, class between the school of um, school of nursing and the warden school back in 2002 when I graduated. Um, Dean Veriel was one of my favorite professors back then. You know how time flies. Um, <laughs> and now she's you know she's she's the dean. So really really excited to to you know kind of to see her and the work that she's doing there. Um, I now live in Nairobi, Kenya, and work across Africa. And no, I'm not cousins with Obama, and um, I don't know where his birth certificate is either. So it's not in Kenya. Um, I've spent uh, my career so far in clinical nursing, you know, at the NICU, in management consulting in the United States, and then now in global health, um, where I provide technical assistance to help governments across the developing world, uh, mostly in Africa, um, to make better evidence-based um, healthcare decisions for their citizens. So I've worked at the director level, the Clinton Foundation, the Gates Foundation, and the Aspen Institute, and I'm on the board of a social enterprise based in Nairobi called the Jacaranda Health Maternity. So across Africa, nurses are critical in making pregnancy and childhood safe for women and newborns. So for a while, um, in Malawi, we had seen a, a critical healthcare um, workforce shortages, particularly with nurses and midwives. I um, may still say today, actually, that there are more doctors in the city of Manchester, England, than there are in all of Malawi. It also was not uncommon to see many government clinics um, staffed with only two nurses. It's important to note that um, nearly 95% of the population in Malawi accesses primary health care through these government facilities. So the duo of these two super nurses, um, you know, would each work one week on and one week off, 24-7 in those clinics. So you can imagine this isn't a, an ideal situation um, or even a sane situation um, to be in at all. So, Given that, however, the interventions that were being used before relied heavily on retention mechanisms that clearly weren't working. You know, pay more, um, pay nurses more, you know, give them more overtime, um, require them to honor the government, government scholarships and work where they were posted, even when some of them got married and had to move where their husbands or wives had moved to. 
and many, many other interventions that really weren't working. So in the preceding five years, the government and donors in Malawi had spent over $100 million on these interventions. So we then we fast forward to when we come in um, in Malawi, the Clinton Foundation, and my team and I developed a human resources for health tool that will be used to analyze what combination of policy interventions, whether it's on training, hiring, deployment, or retention, that then would provide us with a sufficient impact to reach our desired staffing targets across the country. No one before had really thought about this problem holistically. You know, so critical thinking and the holistic approach was at the very core of what I took away from my Penn nursing education. In the end, um, through a whole range of interventions, analysis, meetings, meetings and meetings and talking and convincing people, we it was very clear after looking at all the variables that um, the only way that we got caught up was if we doubled the output of nurse midwifery programs across Malawi. So we were able to move from a baseline of 500 nurses to 2,500 nurses within four years at one-fifth the previous expenditure. So 20 million instead of 100 million before. In addition, we are pairing this program with the National Nurse Mentorship Program that we piloted in Kenya, where mentors are deployed across 10 facilities for one to two days a week, working along line, alongside frontline nurses, using innovative tools and teaching methods to improve the emergency obstetric and newborn care skills and patient-centered care. There's a pressing need to go beyond the one-time didactic training models where, um, which are insufficient for the acquisition and retention of these life-saving skills. So we, we want to maintain really a high quality midwifery skills throughout um, as an ongoing practical training um, program and then encourage consultations across the network of facilities um, so that we can demonstrate that nurse mentorship can achieve sustainable, large-scale, high-impact results in government facilities and unleash the full potential nurses have in saving lives. Just unbelievable, Kasimbi. Your holistic approach in problem solving on such a high level, including so many disciplines, is truly impressive. I am honored to call each and every one of you a fellow alumni, and I'm so impressed by your important work. I hope you'll continue to keep us up to date on all that you will accomplish personally and professionally in the near, and uh, in near future and, and moving forward. Dean, I have to ask you about something. At the bottom of each slide, we have this new text since our last webinar, Innovating for Life and Living. It seems to fit really well with what we just heard from our alumni. Now, I've heard this phrase before, but many of our listeners on the phone may not have heard. Can you tell us? what it means for Penn Nursing and for the next few years? Sure, um, and again, just let me give my uh, thanks to the three alumni presenters. Um, I know their stories intimately, and I'm just so proud of the work that they're doing. It is so impactful and so inspiring. Um, and Kasimbi, as an aside, I think you should run for president of Kenya. He hadn't thought about that. So the, uh, the work that our alums just illustrated, I think, really uh, supports the new theme of our I campaign agree. here, which is innovating for life and living. Um, Ashley, you joined me just about two weeks ago with over 100 faculty, students, alumni to announce the launch of our $60 million effort, the Innovating for Life and Living campaign, to build on our outstanding legacy of innovation. Every day, we bring brilliant minds together with a first-class university and health system on a campus that fosters robust collaboration in research, education, and practice. This setting propels innovation and has allowed the school's research to quickly translate from the lab to the bedside, to the halls of Congress, and globally, as you just heard. That's the genius of Penn Nursing. Today, our practices are accelerating applications of new research to improve care. Our methods are, you, are being used to redesign the nation's healthcare system. Because of our school, 
I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that lives have been saved and people in Philadelphia, across the nation and around the globe are living better. That's the impact of Penn Nursing. So we are the number one nursing school in the world, but we can't rest on our laurels. And that title isn't enough without really looking at what the impact of what we do. Our goal of this campaign is to build on our legacy of innovation, pushing the envelope and taking risks to lead to a healthier future by impacting, the policy, by impacting policy and practice, by leading future research and discovery, and preparing the next generation of Penn nursing leaders. This isn't about ranking. This campaign isn't even about legacy. It's about impact. And that's the vision of Penn Nursing. I want to thank the alumni one more time. <laughs> really impressive, and uh, our impact and, and innovating for life and living has resonated in their stories. I'm go going to ask our audience now to participate. Can everyone raise your hand if you were able to attend the campaign launch two weeks ago or watch the incredible campaign video that was sent out by email? The campaign launch and video cultivate palpable passion and pride for Penn Nursing in our future. Jean, I certainly feel that energy and excitement building. Tell us, how are you focusing that energy into a plan? So we have uh, three major po uh, components of the campaign that builds upon our strategic vision for the school. The first one is education and leadership build vision. Next is research and discovery solutions. And the last one is policy and practice impact. In each of these areas, we're looking to the future and seeking funds to support our students, faculty, and also to build an infrastructure that is critical to move us forward. Those of you who know me know that I, I'm not a patient person, and I feel an even greater urgency to get these priorities funded over the next three years. Ashley, this campaign matters to me because it matters to our students, the faculty, and the alumni of this remarkable school. How can we help? I'm asking our alumni and friends to join me in making this exciting vision a reality by supporting the campaign, by advocating with us, by volunteering, by connecting with us, by sharing your stories. Now is the time because we have an entire university campaign backing our own efforts and increased visibility because of it. We're an amazing group of students, faculty, overseers, staff, alumni, and investors and we can all play a part in our success. This is the power of Penn Nursing. And Ashley, I know you've been busy working with the alumni relations team to create a number of engagement goals for the school. Can you tell us a little bit about what alumni can do? Of course. Over the last year, we've been working with the alumni office at Penn Nursing and Penn Alumni to discuss areas of top focus for building the engagement of our alumni and friends. These fall into several areas. That include enhancing and evaluating our programming, supporting students, and building our data sources. We will be asking alumni to take part in three ways. First, by participating in programming, by volunteering, and by giving of their time, talent, and financially. All of us can participate. Here's one easy step. Pull up QuakerNet. You can do it right now. And make sure your profile is up to date. Do we have your current email? your address, and your work information. Sounds really simple, doesn't cost anything, but this step is really critical. How can we invite you to Penn Nursing in your town if you don't know, that we don't know that you live there? How can we connect a potential Penn Nursing student looking for a mentor if we don't know where you are currently working? I promise your information is private and won't be given out without your permission, but information, incorrect information costs time, money, and robs us, and more importantly you, of the abilities to connect meaningfully with one another and with us. So, Dean, is, are, is your contact information updated? You know what, I don't think I've ever been in QuakerNet. <laughs> May I show you how today? Yeah. I actually, I, I just updated my information as well. It's definitely a, a, it's a new platform. I encourage everybody to take a look. Yeah, I think you know where you can find me, but yeah, okay, I'll go on QuakerNet. <laughs> so thanks, Ashley. We have a few minutes left, um, and I'd like to uh, share with our listeners um, one important event. There's many important events, but one that's coming up uh, rather quickly that I'd like for you to be aware of 
that again um, highlights and illustrates the, the policy and practice impact that we've had in one particular area, and that's in the area of aging. So we're having a critical conversation that we're putting together next week. And on May 2nd, Regina Herzlinger and moderator Jackie Judd will lead a conversation on improving life in an aging society, the critical role of nurses. Uh, it's going to be a lecture. And for those of you, who, uh, it's an open invitation, so if you're in the area, please come and attend. For those of you who can't attend in person, you can view the live stream on YouTube at the link above. This is a kickoff to um, an invitational conference that we're having with policymakers, foundation leaders, um, et cetera, that's being led by Mary Naylor and Nancy Hodgson and supported by our new Portland Center. And the purpose is really to see how we can advance nursing-led solutions to the care of, of elders. Um, we know what the answers are, and we have the evidence to back it up, we know it saves money, but we can't move the needle. And this is our effort to be able to move that forward. We're thrilled um, with the leadership of Nancy and Mary. We know that they can help us move that forward. And I'm thrilled to have the support of one of our overseers, Tony Bavitis, who supported this effort. Yes, this, this topic's near and dear to my heart. Uh, in the setting of an aging population, attention to the holistic needs of older adults is of paramount importance. And I can't think of anyone more qualified than 10 nurses to set the agenda uh, and lead the charge in building healthy and happy uh, aging societies. I look forward to attending that fantastic conversation. Since we're talking about events, I'd like to put in a plug for Alumni Weekend coming up in just a few short weeks. We have a terrific lineup of events, including the annual Student Alumni and Faculty Awards Ceremony on Friday, our Legacy Breakfast, a star cast of faculty presenting about nutrition, and of course, the annual Parade and Picnic. Please mark your calendars and plan to join us on May 11th through May 13th here on campus. And, Dean, there might be a special superhero moment you don't want to miss during the parade. Yeah, I can't wait to find out more about that. <laughs> I don't know what's being planned, so uh, we'll see. All right. So we have a few questions from our um, participants. So let's start with the first one. Jean, do you foresee nurse practitioners gaining a broader scope of practice in Pennsylvania? I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> Me too. I am just so tired of dealing dealing with this, and we're we're getting so close. Um, last week there was a large nurse practitioner advocacy day um, to help um, raise support among our legislators for moving this bill forward. So we were successful in moving the bill out of the Senate in this past year, like we were last year. And we have some, I mean, we're applying constant pressure um, around the state with our colleagues. We've been, been involved in a number of coalitions, including with our UPH um, S partners to support Bill uh, 100 to expand the scope of practice in Pennsylvania. So if there are any Pennsylvania folk on the line, especially those of you who are working in rural settings, we've sent information out and we'll send it out again for you to continue to um, ask your legislators to get the bill on to a vote. That's all, that's all we're asking. We think we have the votes to be able to move it. The momentum is strong. It, it, it's time, it's past time. Absolutely, and I think constant pestering and pushing to your, um, state representatives is really important. It's time. How does the dean see the School of Nursing leading in the fields of population health and community health? Um, you know, we're fortunate to have a number of, of different leaders on our faculty and certainly a push from our students um, for us to be engaged more in the community. So um, as I've, Terry Lipman is a huge champion for, for community engagement and how what we've talked about is that community engagement is a tool for our students to learn about the social determinants of health. And so whether you're working in an ICU setting or whether you say I'm never going to step foot in a community again or ever, I mean our our patients leave eventually leave an ICU and they go they go home. And so we have to understand what the context is where people live, learn, work, and play so that we can help them manage their illnesses and that we can help keep the health them healthy. 
So um, there have been a number of initiatives. Our Community um, Champions Program is one where that's really been led by our undergrads to see about um, how they can be working more actively and engaged in community settings. We have a course around the social determinants of health that's led by, by Terry and a group of other faculty that again provides us the, the support that we need um, and sort of the education component behind to be able to engage. And that's a multidisciplinary course, so we're excited about that. We also have a community partnership program that was started off with a, a great do donation from a, a couple of our, our overseers, uh, the Boazes, who, again, we're really striving to make sure that our, our clinicals, in uh, particular primary care clinicals, really see people outside of the health services, but all these safety net um, uh, hospital, uh, safety net providers, again, to get a better perspective of um, how how the social determinants of health impact health and living. I remember my community clinical as an undergraduate, and I think that we've made big strides, but it's such an important area. Jane, what would you identify as our most pressing professional priority, and how do we focus on innovation? I think I think we have a number of, of, of different challenges. I think um, I would say leadership in the profession is is one. Um, I think leadership and making sure that our voices are heard, um, specifically as it relates to shaping policy, is is critically important. I think the uh, future of nursing, the Campaign for Action, which I co-lead, has been an incredible support for uniting people at the state levels and again at the national level to move in a few in a few targeted areas. But we need to continue to work together and work together with our community partners and interdisciplinary partners to keep focus on, on the life and the health of our, of our populations. And I think that's what we need to do. In terms of the focus on innovation, I want us to be the leaders in innovation. We are so primed um, to do that, to be that. I think, again, I mentioned what we have done in the last year, last year and a half in that area. And so, um, supported by this great university and the resources that we have here, we really need to think about preparing our nurses in a way that not that, that they innovate, and that their, innovates, their innovations are front and center. Many times people come to nurses for ideas and then they leave us in the dust. And we need to have those business acumen skills and the partnership with many different people so that we can con continue to lead in how these things are rolled out. I couldn't agree with you more. I do want to invite our participants on the phone. If you have a question, now's a great time to type it in that questions box and we can try to answer it. How is the School of Nursing working to ensure nurses have a voice and a role in big data and precision medicine, two of our priorities? So, you know, again, I think we, we've always had a voice in there and we've also always had um, innovations in those areas. In the area of, of big data, I think it's, again, preparing scientists to, um, with the tools to understand how is it that we use the data to answer the questions that we have. We always don't have to be these big computer programmers, um, et cetera, but we need to be able to pose the questions that big data can be able to answer. In relation to precision medicine, it's not, it's not just about genes. But it's, again, figuring out the right intervention for the right patient, for the right family at, at the right, right time. time. And recognizing that those processes in terms of, of, of precision interventions are as important as a uh, linking a disease to a genetic finding. I think, and I'm so inspired by the work of Margaret Sauters um, in what she does with autistic children. I, mean, I call her the super, the super nanny, really, of, of, that, pop, of that population. And for her to be able to go into a home, to assess the behavioral patterns of the child, to understand the, the dynamic and the environment, and then to prescribe a behavioral intervention that helps to increase sleep or decrease agitation, I mean, it, it's worth a million bucks to, to those parents. And it so, changes their life. Absolutely. So, again, highlighting the work. I mean, and that's not, that's not, that's science. Absolutely. That's science, and that's the the art of of what we do in nursing. So I think making stories like that front front and center, like our colleagues did today, is absolutely important. 
I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I think the ability to make one day better and then to share that information and make things better for populations and communities is fantastic. Casey, Allison, and Kasimbi have also agreed to stay on the call and take part. Uh, you can ask questions for them as well. So actually, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> so, what are you going to be doing in the next couple months? So, in just a few short days, I defend my dissertation on Tuesday, the the first of May, and I looked at collaborative practice agreements, which is part of the scope of practice legislation that we're looking at in Pennsylvania. Similar legislation is uh, taking place in, in Florida. So, um, by law, nurse practitioners in Florida and 20 other states are required to have uh, a collaborative practice agreement. We don't really know what these agreements say, and the Federal Trade Commission has raised questions about if these agreements help to preserve safety in any way in the way that they're written, um, and also could they prevent providers from entering practice, which we know from uh, competition policy increases the cost of services, decreases access, and really squanders innovation. So I looked at collaborative practice agreements in Florida, um, and uh, I will present my results next next week and following my defense I will start the Robert uh, the National Clinician Scholars Program at the University of Pennsylvania looking at nursing regulations uh, particularly in the post-acute care setting and how we can modify regulations to really enable nurses to lead in, in care planning and delivering health uh, to communities that really serve communities better serve state and local economies better but most importantly serve patients better that's a very competitive program, so congrats on Thank being you. accepted to that. Thank you. I'm very excited. And what else will you be doing? I <laughs> <laughs> We have a third edition joining our family, <laughs> um, a third child. So um, we have another baby joining in August. And we're quite excited to have our, our family grow. And um, my children have really inspired much of the work that I do. If I'm, I, I like being outside of the house. If, if I'm going to be outside of the house, <laughs> I'm going to be making sure that my work is impactful and important, and they are the inspiration for, for my work as a nurse and really provide a great outlet when I go home. Great. Well, I hope our alums are inspired by you. Thank you. Um, I can't believe that you're going to be graduating. I mean, we started, I think, I feel like we started off this journey here together. Absolutely. And to know that you're, you're coming at the end of it makes me makes me sad. Well, it makes me happy that you're done, eh? Yeah. Um, be that you've got an, a great opportunity to continue with your uh, area of scholarship, I think it will absolutely be fabulous, and I know we'll always be connected here. So. Absolutely. Uh, I haven't strayed far either. I think the continued connection with Penn Nursing is really important. It's encouraged me to ask questions that I wouldn't have asked otherwise and provided me with a great um, support system to take the next step in my career, and I encourage all of our alumni to stay connected. This is a really great group. Uh, that that is supportive of each other and, and pushes the needle forward as a collective. So I think that's all the time we have for questions. I want to thank you, Dean, for your time and inspiring each of us to be part of Penn Nursing's future. And lastly, I want to thank each of our alumni, participants, faculty, and students for sharing your time, talent, and passion with Penn Nursing. I hope everyone keeps in touch. Thanks, everybody.